Uh, I would like now to uh, uh, ask uh, Carl Widerquist from his perspective as an active member of the Executive Committee uh, of Bien uh, to give us his view of the work, uh, the ongoing work on the work in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess we should have had Philippe go last. <laughs> He's, uh, I think his will be the most interesting speech. Uh, I'm uh, here just to sum up a few things. I have uh, uh, first uh, uh, one small announcement. Uh, there was somebody in the last session, the one where we had two presentations uh, on Brazil. Someone there uh, borrowed one of these translation machines from Eduardo, um, and then they, they didn't. Uh, they lost each other and weren't, weren't able to give it back. And so, no, so now Eduardo can't get his passport back and can't return to his homeland until this is returned to him. So if you're that person, if you could please... Yeah, it was in room... Okay. Otherwise, maybe he'll be applying for citizenship here in Germany. Uh, <laughs> And speaking of, uh, speaking of translation, uh, we, we thanked the uh, student translators, but also uh, the regular translators are still back there and still at work, and uh, we should thank them as well. I appreciate them. I, I don't know how they do it when we're using this uh, esoteric... Uh, academic ease, all this language that we're using. I'm using words that I had to look up myself to figure out what word I wanted to, what, what word would use here, and, and making up words like degrowth and stuff, and they have to translate that. So uh, I, I thank them very much. Uh, I would also uh, like to thank uh, uh, Lu Louise Hogg, who is, uh, who is unable to be here from the executive committee, and to someone else who's been mentioned several times, but uh, Dorothy Schutzbasta, who's been one of the primary organizers of this conference and who was unable to make it this weekend, so you might not be aware of all that she's done, but Ingrid and I have worked closely with her, with her uh, for two years while she and Raymond and others were putting this conference together. And I'd really like to thank Dorothy quite a bit. Uh, now... <laughs> I also uh, have in my back pocket a message uh, that comes from Namibia. Bishop Kamita of, uh, uh, of Namibia, who is one of the principal forces behind the Namibian pilot project that we've heard so much about. Uh, uh, I, he, I, Eduardo put me on the phone with him yesterday, and next thing I know, I was taking notes for a message from him. So here's a message for all of us from Bishop Kamita. What you are doing there is the future of the world, the future of justice and peace, what we cannot keep quiet at all. Although the Namibians can't be with you, what you are doing is close to our hearts and close to the hearts of all people who love justice. Bishop Now, my role here is more of a, an, an informational role. Uh, I want to tell you a few things that are going on on basic income, uh, mostly about what BN is doing, but I will let you know one thing that, uh, that I'm involved in, it's very important to me. Uh, about five years ago, an, an editor from Palgrave Macmillan Publishers approached me a, a, about a proposal, and I thought she was going to ask me to do one book on basic income, and she asked me to do to edit a book series, um, and with two to three books a year, I thought that was impossible. But we launched the series this year with five books, uh, five books on basic income, all from one publisher, uh, that are all on the uh, that are all on the display table downstairs, in, including some books that, uh, well, of course I co-edited two of those, those I especially like, but some, some other books in the series that 
Um, our special good Simon Birnbaum has a very good work on justice that's discussed here at this conference that's out on the series. Richard Caputo on the politics of basic income. And uh, uh, we're also, one of the things that I'm doing here is uh, looking for authors who are interested in writing books on basic income. And uh, so if you're interested in the series, if you want to know more about it, please, please see me. See me here at the conference or send me an email. Now, uh, I have been the co-chair of BN for the, uh, for, the last, for the last three terms, along with, uh, along with Ingrid. And uh, I've, I've seen important developments in it in these years. Both of us are running for re-election at the GA meeting this afternoon, if you'd like to, to come. I hope you'll vote for us. Um, and uh, I've seen uh, several important developments in it. Uh, basic Income Studies is the first academic journal focusing on basic income research. It's interdisciplinary, but it's all about basic income. It has economics, sociology, philosophy, political science, uh, and many other disciplines in the book, but every paper is directly related to basic income. We've had a recent trans transition. Uh, Jim Mulvale and Louise Hogg are the, are the editors who took over this year. They will be giving uh, an essay prize for the best English language essay at this, uh, at this conference. We can't give a prize for the best essay in this conference because it's an English language journal and we have no capacity to translate. So all, the best we can do is, is, to, uh, is uh, for the English language papers. If you have a paper in English that you're interested in, uh, that you're interested uh, in publishing in a good academic journal that focuses on basic income, uh, basic income studies, you should, you should look into that this for, submit, for submitting your, your papers. Uh, it, is, uh, it is, I think, important for the academic end of the debate on basic income. The basic income issue is so complicated and gets into so many different areas. We need all kinds of people in the movement. We need political leaders, and we need, we need grassroots political activists, and we need and we need academics who are carrying on the discussion in, in those sorts of areas. And, and basic income studies is one thing that's holding, that is doing that. This is, basic income stu studies is largely sponsored by BN. BN has given it um, some seed money to get started, as has Red Rent Abasica, the, uh, the Spanish basic income network. Uh, now, but for the very other end of journals that focus on basic income, the non-academic news journals focusing on basic income, the uh, Basic Income European Network started its newsletter back in 1988. Um, and at that time, uh, at that time, newsletters used to be produced on this thing called paper. And they were sent out by mail. People would actually, they'd actually get a physical copy of this in the mail. It would come in the mail. And it went that way for, I think, over 10 years until they finally, and that when it was called at that time the, the basic income newsletter, because uh, it literally came in a letter. Uh, but then uh, it, it, and the original editor was Philippe von Parijs, who's sitting over there. Um, and he edited it for uh, just a mere 16 years. Uh, and in and he, for, he saw it through the transition to what it became the basic income news flash when it went, when it went on to the Internet and was sent out by email, as we all, as we all know publications go out today. Uh, and uh, he edited it for this time. And then um, in 2004, he passed on the editorship of... Uh, the news flash to Yannick Thunderboat, who's sitting out there somewhere. Yannick, Yannick over there. And Yannick is partially stepping down this year as news flash editor. He's come to the end of his, the end of his term as news flash editor since 2000, for eight years, four terms as news flash editor. And he's stepping down, but he's not leaving as a, as a writer. He's leaving as the editor but he's, he's going to be, still be a contributing writer. Uh, and, and now, I have some experience in this field because uh, when the U.S. Basic Income Guarantee Network got started back in, 
back in the year uh, 2000, I volunteered to write the newsletter for the U.S. Basic Income Guarantee Network, and it was much later in history than 1988, so we went directly to uh, email only, and I have been editing that for the last 12 years. And last year, in 2011, Yannick and I, with help of Jörg Drescher and several others, started a news website on basic income called Basic Income News. And if you want up-to-date information about what's going on on basic income around the world, go to basic income news, uh, binews.org. BINews.org. It's worldwide news on basic income, sponsored by BN and its national affiliates around the world. Many, uh, there, are, there are 17, hopefully soon there'll be 21 or 22 affiliates. Uh, we'll see at the meeting today when some new applications come in. And we have about five of them participating right now, and we're hoping to widen participation. It started as a joint effort between BN and US Big, and it's grown. To, uh, it's grown now to uh, a, uh, it's grown now to about five or six of the affiliates are officially participating. We hope to get more and more of them participating. And so uh, uh, there are going to be some changes at the news flash and the news and B BI news that we're hoping to integrate these much more. For the last, for the last year and a half, the newsletter and the news flash have been, have been working in parallel. And uh, I should also announce that I have been nominated um, to run to replace, to replace Yannick as the editor of the news flash. So I'll be the, if I succeed in winning the election at the GA this afternoon, I will be the third editor of the BN news flash. And our goals for the News Flash in this term is to further integrate it with the BI News website and to integrate it with the various newsletters of any of the affiliates who wish to join. So if you are a, if you uh, work for one of the affiliates, if you're uh, a member of one of the affiliate organizations, uh, we're hoping to integrate the, the BI News website and the BN News Flash uh, with with newsletters of, so there'll be a different edition for each of the, uh, the member countries. I'll be editing both the BN News Flash and the U.S. big edition of the BN News Flash, and we'll hope we get others involved. So uh, if you are involved with one of the national affiliates, please see me about integrating our newsletters and integrating the news website, but also the BN News, the BI News website, binews.org, is, is completely volunteer run. No one is getting paid anything for what they're doing here. And we have right now about five volunteers who are writing all the news that you see on BI News. And we can use some more volunteers. We can use, we can use volunteers to write for BI News. We also need copy editors, people with HTML skills, um, all, uh, um, all sorts of people to help us out with this. Please uh, send me an email or go to the website and find the contact information. We need people to help. It's, it's a lot of fun. You get to be up to date on what's going on in Mongolia and Namibia and, and in rural Brazil, what's going on in basic income. When I started writing about uh, the, the basic income newsletter uh, for US Big in 2000, I thought there can't be news about this policy that, that that isn't even in place and uh, hardly anywhere in the world. There can't be news on this to fill a newsletter. But sure enough, if you start to follow it, there's news happening all around the world. There's so much news happening, you can barely keep up with it. Um, there is a new proposal in this country or something like something, a step towards b b basic income in another country. There's things happening. So there's a, it's, a, it's a lot of fun to follow up on that. And, uh, and it's uh, also a good way to get some writing credits and so forth. So I hope to get everybody further involved. Now, the last thing that I want to say is that after this meeting, uh, there's going to be a lunch break. And after the lunch break, there's going to be at 3 o'clock the GA meeting, which is happening right across the hall in the room that I can't pronounce, but it's right across the hall. Latsa. Uh, Latsa. Is that right? Okay. In that room, uh, right across the hall at 3 o'clock, 
Um, anyone can attend, but you have to be a life member of Bien to vote. So I hope that you'll all attend, and I hope to, and that uh, all of those of you who are life members will, will discuss and vote the issues, and I will see you all there, and I'll turn it back to you. Uh, vielen Dank, Karl. Uh, Thank you, Karl. We had a problem in the organization because the press conference will start now at 1 o'clock. This is why some of us, our colleagues from Bien, some of them have to go and attend the press conference. So Ingrid van Niekerk will give her speech now. Um, and I would love to ask her to tell us this perspective of the Bien Executive Committee, and she'll give us some interesting statements. Thank you. So apologies, I'm not Louise Haag. Louise Haag was going to speak to you about the basic income um, editing work that she does, and because she's not available to be here, um, I'm going to speak a little bit on some of the things um, that I've noticed and, and seen. And I wanted to reflect on the idea that this was about pathways to basic income, and I come from a developing country, and the pathways in terms of a developing country is vastly different from the pathway, I think, that a developed country will take in terms of developing a basic income. Most of the work that Carl and others do is on basic income, but I'm at a way different level. My work um, um, at an NGO in South Africa is about uh, um, working on cash transfers, designing, implementing, um, helping to do impact evaluations of various types of cash transfers. And so what role I can play with basic income is that I can help to spread the word about how to universalize these basic incomes. And I think that brings us to the basis of when we need to start with the basic income. No conditionality and universal. And so one of the things we do, we, we try to, to figure out whether it's the right thing and it's the right thing at the right time for that particular country to introduce a universal cash transfer. And incredibly, many of these are being introduced in developing countries in Asia and in Africa, and they're mostly done for children. So you will find a geographical targeting within a specific area, a universal target, uh, 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 sorry, it's called geographical targeting, but it means it's universal within that specific region, within that specific geographical space. And so they're beginning to get very comfortable with this idea of universalizing basic um, cash transfers which I hope one day will build up in these developing countries to a space where we can see it move from the region to the province to maybe the country in as far as these cash transfers are concerned. And in South Africa, we have this. We can see the progressive realization where uh, when Mandela came out of prison, he, he asked for a, um, a child support grant up to the age of seven, and now we have that up to the age of 12, and then it was 14, and now it's up to the age of 18. So all children, it's still means tested, but all poor children at least are receiving a child support grant to, up to the age of 18. But let me take you back to um, some of the work that I do. So in these training courses that I do, and bear with me, I'll just be five minutes, I have a little story for you. In these training courses that I do, one of the biggest questions that we keep getting asked is, how do you finance this? How do you finance this universal cash transfer? And I, I'm so tired of saying, you know, you need to think of the tax policies, you need to think of the growth of your economy. And I say, it's a Thursday afternoon, and I say to people, let's put away the books. Let's just play a little game. And so I divide the group, one half, and into another half. And I say, over here, here is your tax papers. Please decide on a tax regime for your country. Five of you are in a country, five of you are in a country, five of you are in a country. One of you will have a high income, two of you will have a middle income, and three of you will have a low income. And I do that the same on the other side of the room. One side of the room has a targeted system, and the other side of the room has a universal system. And I say, calculate the tax rate that you would like to pay in your country. 
Okay, the calculated tax rate, the targeted group, and the one that's got the universal program, they calculate the tax rate, and they get confused about who's supposed to receive the benefit, because now they have to pay out the full benefit as a universal cash transfer of some sort, like a BI, a basic income. And the people over there will calculate, and they will have um, maybe 10%, and the people over here will calculate, and they'll say maybe 20%. And then they figure it out, and then I say, okay, let's do this again. Now you can change the tax rate. And lo and behold, the people in the targeted group will go down from 10% taxes down to 5% taxes, and the people in the universal group will go from 20% taxes to 30 to 40 or to 50% taxes paying in that country. And I come back and I say, oh my goodness, why? Why are you doing this? And it's all about self-interest, because one of the assumptions I make right at the beginning, I say to them, when you are calculating your taxes, you are considering self-interest, okay? You must act in your own interest. And look how things are. When you do have a universal system, it seems that people are prepared to pay higher taxes. When you have a non-universal system, a, a targeted system, people will want to pay lower taxes. And then I say, one more thing. Okay, everybody, you can go live in any country you wish to live. It's amazing. Three quarters of the people from that room end up on this side of the room. And I am blown away. I'm completely blown away. And it really just comes down to a few things. And one of the things is that the middle class actually benefit more when there is a universal system. And so they are prepared to negotiate within the group to make sure that that happens, because the poor people benefit, but the middle class also benefits. There will occasionally be a few people who are the wealthiest, and then they will go form their own little country over there, and they'll be, you know, the Cayman Islands or somewhere where they flee. But there will always be a few of them who stay in the universal countries. And I ask them, why do you stay in the universal countries? And they say, I want to live in a country where there is justice. And so, and so I am astounded every time by this game. And I would like to share this game with some of the activists um, so that you can begin to play this game and you can see what kind of effects this game has on people. And I was reminded by that, particularly by something that Gotz Werner said the other day. He was saying, and let me just find my notes, he said, you have to think first, and then you have to feel, and then you have to take action. And I think we think too much. We're all in the head, and we don't feel enough, and there are many of us that take action, but not everybody. And I think if, if we take this into consideration, the heart needs to be convinced before we will be able to make any change. These are small things but they can make such a big difference. You need to not only appeal to the academic brain, but you need to appeal to the heart. So find ways in your activism to be able to do that. And lastly, I just want to reflect um, for a moment um, on what's happening in India, and I, and I was reminded by that. Um, um, Carl was saying here too um, that Bishop Kameta had said, what, do you, what you are doing is close to our hearts, and close to the people who love us. Again, coming back to the heart, it's ironic that you have a heart sphere program which is not universal and unconditional, and so maybe you need to do something about that and take us back to the heart. But I want to just end with um, one more thing that I, I thought about as far as the um, Indian connection that we have now, the pilots that are happening in India. The members of the Sewa who saved with us their successes and their challenges in these pilots and comes back to words that Gandhi had used, and he said, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ingrid. I think that was the right message at the right time.
to involve our hearts even more. The final speaker is my colleague in the network, Matthias Blöcher. He'll be talking to us about the German view on things and what we have in mind in the near future. Yeah, um it's always difficult to look back on the results of such a conference and the feedback. It was all very exciting over the last four days. We can. It's hard to see how many people who were actually here because we were split up into groups. And I think I can look back on four excellent days, the pre-conference day and the three days of the conference. And we shouldn't forget all of the action days that have been going on at the same time. We had 450 participants. I think there are about 150 speakers. And we have participants from 29 countries. That's very impressive. We don't want to forget the 50 assistants who helped us out in all sorts of different ways to make this whole conference possible. <clears throat> what was offered was quite broad. Lots of papers were submitted, all sorts of workshops, and I think that there was good use was made of entering into discussions and as we've already heard, the breaks were just as important as what happened in the rooms themselves. We are a network, and this network activity was really put into practice even during the breaks. It was a great opportunity to really get more information so that we can do our work for the world outside. What I'd like to do now is to mention three aspects, and that is what were the things that we can take away. Well, I think an important thing is was for academics and practitioners and activists all came together. So it wasn't just an academic conference. So we had a real diverse exchange here. Another point, and Philippe already touched upon this, and we found that the questions surrounding basic income, the whole area has been expanded. We have to think of other areas, growth, development. But I think we also have to consider the question of gender equality or gender mainstreaming. This is something that's becoming more and more important. Questions of human rights were also very important. And that's something that we also have to consider. We have to just not only talk about the instrument itself. And we wanted to find pathways to basic income. That was the motto, the title of this conference. And we have to think about the starting point in the different countries. They're very different from one country to the next. And we talked about pilot projects in Brazil and India. We took a look at India. So maybe we can note that pilot projects need a starting point, and these can be very different depending on the starting situation in the different countries. For Germany, for example, what could such a starting point be? It, what could be the germ cell, so to speak? We could talk about children or child support or help for older people or no sanctions, for example. These would be the next step towards arriving at basic income. Philippe also mentioned the three, uh, the three Bien criteria, and the German network has four criteria, individual rights, claim to rights, no means testing, no requirement to work, and 
we also want to have subsistence so that everyone can participate in society. This is not what we have at Bieng. And we thought, okay, originally, if you take a look at what was happening in the workshops, you take discussions on poverty. This is a very important issue. And it's you can expand, we can expand our freedom, and this is only possible if you don't live in pro- poverty. So we would suggest that Bieng look and see if maybe this aspect can be included in your criteria, and I'm sure we'll do so later on. And that is a possibility for a positive development. So to conclude, what were the benefits of this conference for Germany, locally speaking? We will be having federal elections, parliamentary elections, fairly soon. And I hope that all of the networks will make sure that we don't have a candidate who doesn't discuss this issue at all. They all have to take a stand on it. They have to tell us what their position is. It has to be made more public so that we can make active use of these elections so that it will be an issue. And the network will not suffice. All of us here need to become active in this respect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matthias. I believe there are mics on the table, and I would like to ask are three representatives a question. What do you think? At what Bien conference will we be able to announce the first country worldwide which has initiated or implemented basic income? What do you think? to the people that we have problem with the sound of Test, test, test. Yeah. I'm only a philosopher, so I, uh, I can say what must be, but not what will be, and even less when it will be. So I can tell you in which direction, that's my job, is, uh, my, what I'm paid for, I'm, uh, I'm say, I can tell you in which direction we need to go, and, uh, but I'm not going to make a forecast. Now, um, Sometimes, nevertheless, tactically, it may be a good idea to give dates and indeed to give over-optimistic dates uh, in order to activate things. But personally, I have a different strategy, which is that I'm a, a methodologically a pessimist. That is, I think, uh, I convince myself that uh, a number of things will not happen soon. And if you do that, Life is full of good surprises. I like to be an optimist. I'm not a philosopher. I'm an activist. Um, I don't know. Um, I would like to believe, and I would you know, like to quote Eduardo in this lifetime. I think we have to think about in this lifetime. And I think more and more so with the world, of will, the world of work changing, I think, and that happening so dramatically um, over the past few crises that capitalism has had since the mid-80s. And those crises are getting narrower and they're getting more intense. And so I think something has to shift and something has to change. And so within that space, I think there is movement and it is up to us to create and improve on that space for movement. So take up the challenge and be active. I think 
Well, I think sometimes things have to get worse before they get better. I hope not much worse. And I do hope that this crisis that we're going through now, not so much for economic reasons, but it's something that's our, something that we feel as a gut feeling. So maybe they can begin to do some rethinking. We're talking about involving our hearts once again. And I think things should improve, hopefully soon, and I can see some light at the end of the tunnel, some germ cells, so to speak. Okay, we didn't hear a year. Okay, so please, yeah. I need to say a word about Sure, of course. Yes, yeah, please come up and uh, speak. Okay. Sorry, no problem. Because uh, President Keller from Germany came to Brazil, and when he arrived to the Senate, and the president of the Senate introduced me to to President Keller, he said, well, are you Senator Edward Suplicy? I want to introduce you to my friend who is a member of the delegation here, Mr. Gottsberner. And so we got together. He invited me to be here in, in Berlin as well in Karlsruhe, Karlsruhe together with Mohamed Yunus to speak about uh, the microcredit and the basic income to promote entrepreneurship and to eradicate poverty. And so I came. I had a, a very enriched interaction with him. And I wanted to say I was so pleased to, to meet him again here and to know that not only, well, in 2008, I knew that... Uh, DNM had 900 units in Germany and 300 in the neighboring countries. Today I ask him, there are now, if I'm not wrong, 1,300 here and 1,200 uh, in other countries. And at the same time, I see that on that day he gave me the book, Ein Income for All, that was a bestseller, and now he has an, another book that is also a bestseller, and I would like him to have it in Portuguese as well as in English, because I cannot today read in, in Deutsch. But so I want to compliment uh, Mr. Gottswenner in the name of all of us, uh, and to say how good it is that a very uh, successful entrepreneur has been persuaded, and not only persuaded, but he started a campaign, as we all of Bien, to introduce the basic income, not only in Germany, but in our planet. So, I, before he leaves, uh, I wanted to say <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Uh, uh, and if you allow me, uh, with respect to your question, first of all, wh when will the basic income start? Well, let us recognize that it has started already in one of the United States, Alaska. It has it has a tremendous positive result. Alaska has become the most equal of the 50 North American states. Last year, Gini coefficient of the United States was 0.47. In the District of Columbia, the most unequal 0.533, even higher than that of Brazil, 0.519. And in Alaska, last year was 0.40. This is a tremendous result. Very positive for our cause. 
Yesterday, Philip Van Paris mentioned that Iran has already a basic income. I don't know all the details. The professor from Iran, is, it, is he him? He left, but, well, I, I haven't had the opportunity to listen to him, but it's already on the way. And finally, with respect, well, we have the Indian experience, the Ochevero experiences, and in Brazil, Santo Antonio do Pinhal, perhaps next year will start with those who are born in, and every year, this is the proposal because the law has been approved. But we have approved in 2003 a law to introduce a basic income that was sanctioned by President Lula in January 8, 2004. In, and I would like to tell you, in the National Convention of the National Party, of the Workers' Party in February 2010, it was written and approved by all the delegates, 1,350 delegates to the convention that during, in the same convention that approved President Dilma Rousseff as our candidate, that along her mandate, we would initiate the basic income according to the law. So my proposal, if you think it's a good one, is to invite President Dilma Rousseff to be present at our next Bian Congress two years from now, at the end of her first term, probably she will be a candidate again, to tell us how it is the basic income being introduced in Brazil. That's my proposal. <laughs> Thank you very much, Eduardo. So now I want uh, just to... Uh, fall down in English. Sorry, I keep forgetting and speak English. I'd like to pick up on that directly and ask Francesca Obrega to come up front because this is a petition that needs to be submitted for all newborns in Brazil, so that at least that would be a step in the right direction towards a basic income for Good all. To all. Uh, so I'm Francisco Nobrega from Brazil, and I just want to call your attention to a petition that is at the table near the entrance. You know, it's to, uh, the petition is to our president, so she will work towards instituting the basic income law that is in the paper still. And the way it, the law says, so it's, it means by steps. And the, the step we choose is a very gradual and important happening. Our newborns, okay, starting in 2014, if you hope. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now a couple of housekeeping announcements, boring but important. Remember, you have to return your headsets. We would be very unhappy if somebody arrives at the airport and they've got headsets instead of a passport. That wouldn't be a good idea. Papers. If you haven't managed to submit your paper, our website will continue to exist and we will still take on papers. You can still submit them. So if you haven't submitted your paper yet, please do so by the end of September so that we can make it known to everyone. This will be an important source for everyone who wants to read up on what happened here. Maybe they weren't able to be with us, but of course you can't be at 10 workshops at the same time, obviously. Videos. Some private videos were made, videos and photographs, so I'd like you to provide us with your videos and photographs. It's being2012.de, so these documents will then be put on the conference website.
Um, last or so was that um, it, or was there something else? Lost and found. It looks like a few things have been lost and found. So if you've lost something, please come to the conference office and pick up what you may have lost. I don't know, headsets were, a set of headsets was lent out to somebody else. Did you get it back? It seems to have been returned. Everything's fine there. Okay, that brings me to a very important part. It's almost a ritual. I'd just like to thank everyone who helped us to organize this conference. I'm sure you noticed all that was going on at the check-in, Krista Aka, Alyssa, Becca, Roswitha Nislein. Please, if you're still here, some of you have left already, but please come up front so we can see how many people were involved in organizing this. Karen Schreiber at the book desk, Karina Miriam Westermeyer in the office, Fabian, and I wrote down his last name somewhere, but I can't remember what his last name is. What's your last name, Fabian? Kepper. Come on up front. Come up on stage so we can see you. And for the headsets, that was very stressful, Steffi Art, and they couldn't all be here because they have to make sure that they can uh, get the headsets back before people disappear. Jan Droska and the organizational team. We also had Bianca Becker, the key individual who's been helping us out for years now, Millennia Books. Joachim Fuchs Arkrim, he was a girl Friday, so to speak, and really helped to avoid a lot of disasters. And the editors for the website who were writing while the Congress was ongoing, Natalie Pavlovich, Robert Ulmer, Mr. Herbert Wilkins, and the abstracts were translated on a volunteer basis, Renata Drea, Norman Kleesattel, and we'd also like to thank the interpreters who are still with us, and that is Adrian Clark Ott and Irena Sasser, Georg Buchner, Bausewitz, and again, the coordination for all of this was done by Professor Ziegler and some assistance as well. I'd also like to thank people who gave us financial support, the PLS, the GLS Foundation, that's the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, and the Jonas and the Wolf gave us the corporate design for this conference and the website. Donors, there were a lot of donors, and all of the members who made contributions to the network, which we took to help fund this conference, and also contributions that were made by all of you. And that is an important part of the funding behind this conference. A lot of people were willing to take over the chair of workshops if somebody was not able to be with us. And of course, all of the speakers, they put a lot of work into this. They also had high travel expenses and accommodation, and you know that Munich is an expensive place to be, but we still managed to get so many people together here and heard from so many of you. Last but not least, the staff at the Wolf Ferrari House, the technical staff, as well as the ladies in the office, they were very it was, they were very cooperative, and it was very nice working with him. And streaming, this is something that went into the, went on the internet on an ongoing basis. Pascal Renault, who was very hard working. I haven't been able to watch it, but I'm sure that everything was just fine. Great. I think I, and if I forgot anybody, I'm very sorry, but let me say thank you very much, and I'm sorry that I forgot to mention your name. It, your name didn't make it to my sheet of paper. Let's have a nice round of applause for all of our assistants here.
just, uh, I just want to say one more thing. We tend to forget that there are always people that are getting all the other people to do the work. So um, we've thanked Dorothy many times in her absence, but I think, Raymond, we haven't thanked you enough for all the amazing work you've been doing for all of these months and years, and in particularly this past few days when he had to carry the baton alone. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. And also all the members, all the members of the local organizing committee of the network. Okay. Now we're almost, we're almost fast am end and we're going to the end. We're almost done. Now it gets a bit more emotional at the end. And this is at the request of Judith Hafner. She would like to read out a poem that she has written. I will start this in English because it is not possible to translate a poem just like that. Uh, I have realized, I've learned one thing as well at this conference. I have understood that basic income is all about freedom. I understood that it is about courage. And I understood that it is actually about human development. And uh, I understood that it needs to be heartfelt in order to be transmitted and in order to actually happen. And there I learned a lot from Werner. Uh, and I just want to finish off with one poem that brings it from the purely human perspective that we are concerned with and that all the people that we are talking to will be concerned with. And there's a hell of a lot of angry and frustrated potential out there that could be turned into a tremendous positive strength if we manage to transmit this heartfelt in the way that Ingrid was describing. And in als homage an Herrn Werner und seine Kopernikanische Wende. As an homage to Mr. Werner, I would like to say, please turn. In the world that we're familiar with, our salary defines what we call our life, eating, sleeping, etc. If we want to change our life, this is something that is not part of this whole model. If you don't work hard, you will certainly be left behind. And this is something that is a threat to all of us. That's why we all work hard. We run as opposed to sitting back and recognizing one another and to also be part of life because a human being has to be in a hurry. With basic income, this type of hamster race would be, the hamster would be removed or taken out of his cage and we would be at a pathway for a decision. What do we want? Do I want to avoid something? Am I courageous or not? Am I free or am I alone? What I am and what I live would certainly be in suspension then. If we move, remove ourselves from all of our constraints, then we as people have to learn to integrate liberated life. We would have to feel ourselves in a new way as human beings. We're not used to these feelings. We are associated with what pays off or what we think, and to feel and to give ourselves something, that is certainly something which is pri private at the most. We see all of this life that we live, and we see how it will easily become an addiction, everything that we consume. Living like a hamster in a cage, that's hard for a hamster. Water boils at 100 degrees centigrade, but here more things are boiling, and this would really be good to be able to see that we need one another, just like the forest needs rain. This new life will not 
start and the old will not disappear if we wait for one another. Only if we can overcome and if we can really think of what is at the bottom of our hearts is something that separates us today, is something that will give us new life tomorrow. This force from our hearts is something that we are keeping at a distance. But don't give me a hard time. I think we want to recognize all of this. Life is passion. It's to take on new things with new force. Please turn around and let's move away from the old way of doing things. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, not only Ryman, but all the members, not, uh, but all the members of the local organizing committee. I don't know everybody's names, but there was a committee that uh, a committee of about a half a dozen people who worked very hard over the last year or two uh, to put this thing together. And I'd like to thank every every one of them. Thank you very much. And, uh, if you remember earlier, I read a message from Bishop Kamita, one of the uh, main organizers of the pilot project in Namibia. And uh, Eduardo has asked me to remind you that the project is not, is not over yet. They have been, they're still trying to raise funds in order to keep the grant going. And the grant, they've been running out of funds, so the grant has become irregular. Uh, they gave a payment, I think it was in April, and they were unable to give another payment until, until July, but then they made a double payment to make up for that, and they're hoping to make other payments in the future because of all the good that those payments are doing there for the people and to demonstrate how well basic income would work. And Eduardo has asked me to remind that we can all donate. Um, if, if we can all donate to this project, uh, Dirk Harmon is here, and Eduardo is, is right there in front and center. Uh, if you have some uh, euros or dollars or Namibian, uh, Namibian what you call it, um, give them to him, and he'll make sure they get to Dirk and get on a plane to Namibia where they'll go directly to help some people. I have already 100 euros. <laughs> <laughs> about uh, thir 12, 13 dollars, and so uh, any contribution might contribute for the continuation of the basic income family project in Nacevero. Thank you very much. Okay. Vielen Dank. Also... Thank you very much. If anybody has a little extra money, please see Eduardo and we'll put that money to good use. All that remains to be said is thank you all for coming. Thank you for helping us make this conference a successful conference, and I hope it will be a further milestone on our path to basic income. Have a safe trip home and see you next time. Bye-bye.